Hi, and welcome to Danny After Dark. If you're new here, make sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss a notification or a new episode. Tonight, I'll be featuring the case of Donald Henry Gaskins Jr., also known as P.E. Gaskins. This was a highly recommended request by friends of the show Calvin Clifford and Ken Avin. Thank you, Calvin and Ken, for the case recommendation. Now, let's go ahead and find out more. <laughs> let's go ahead and dive on in. Donald Henry Gaskins Jr. was born on March 13, 1933 in Florence County, South Carolina. His mother was not married at the time she became pregnant with him and had lived on and off with several men during her childhood. Many of these men treated Donald with disdain, sometimes beating him just simply for being around. His mother did little to protect him, so Donald was left to raise himself. When his mother did remarry, his stepfather consistently beat him and his four half siblings. Donald was given the nickname Pee Wee at a young age because of his small body frame. When he began school, he would fight daily with the boys and girls and was constantly being punished by the teachers. At 11 years old, he just quit school altogether and started working on cars at a local garage and helped his family around the family farm. At the garage where Pee Wee worked part-time, he met two boys, Danny and Marsh. They were both close to his age, and they were also out of school themselves. The three teamed up and named themselves the Trouble Trio. They began burglarizing homes and picking up prostitutes in nearby cities. Locally, they sometimes even raped young boys, and then they would threaten these boys so that they would not tell anybody or go to the police. These boys only stopped their sexual rampage after they were caught. They were caught gang raping Marsh's younger sister. As punishment, their parents bound and beat the boys until they bled, but not Danny. Danny's father defended him with a shotgun. After this incident, Marsh and Danny ended up leaving the area. Pee Wee continued to break into homes, now doing it solo. In 1946, when he was 13 years old, a girl he knew interrupted him burglarizing a home. She attacked him with an ax, but he managed to get the ax away from her. Then he struck her in the head and arm with the ax before running away from the scene. Miraculously, the girl survived the attack and she named Pee Wee. So Pee Wee was arrested and he was tried and found guilty of assault with a deadly weapon and intent to kill. He was sent to the South Carolina Industrial School for Boys until he would turn 18 years old. When Pee Wee was in reform school, he was immediately attacked and gang raped by 20 of his new peers. Yes, 20 of them. He spent the rest of his time either accepting protection from the dorm boss boy in exchange for sex or trying unsuccessfully to try to escape from the reformatory. The guards repeatedly beat him for his attempts at escaping, and he was also very sexually exploited among the gang favored by the boss boy. In addition, Pee Wee was sent for observation to a state mental hospital. The doctors, however, they found him sane, so they returned him back to the reform school. After a few nights back, Pee Wee tried to escape again and was successful. So he went on with a traveling carnival. It was there where he married a 13 year old girl, but then he made the decision to turn himself into the police and finish his sentence at the reform school. March, 1951, Pee Wee was released on his 18th birthday. After the reform school, Pee Wee got a job on a tobacco plantation. He and a partner then got involved in insurance fraud what they would do is collaborate with other tobacco farmers and burn down their barns for a fee. Well, people in the area began to talk about all of these barn fires and they suspected Pee Wee was involved. So Pee Wee's employer, the daughter, and a friend confronted him about the reputation and whispers about him being the barn burner. And he flipped out. With a hammer in his hand, he split open the girl's skull. So he was sent to prison after receiving a five-year sentence for assault with a deadly weapon and attempted murder. Now back in prison, Pee Wee was immediately assigned to sexually service one of the prison gang leaders in exchange for protection. Pee Wee realized 
The only way he could survive prison was to become known as a power man. Well, what is that? Power men were those who had a reputation for being so brutal and so dangerous that other inmates would stay away from them. But there was a bit of a problem. Pee-wee, he was very small. So this would prevent him from being physically intimidating to others. So they wouldn't respect him. So what Pee-wee did is he set his sights on one of the meanest inmates in the prison, Hazel Rizzo. Pee-wee managed to manipulate himself into a relationship of trust with Hazel. Then he cut his throat. Pee-wee was found guilty of manslaughter and spent six months in solitary confinement. But this earned him the title of power man among the other prisoners. In 1955, Pee-wee's wife filed for divorce. How did he take it? He flipped out and escaped prison. He stole a car and drove to Florida. He then joined another carnival where he married again for the second time. However, this marriage ended in just two weeks. Pee-wee then became involved with another carnival woman, Betty Gates, and the two drove to Cookville, Tennessee because she wanted to bail her brother out of jail. So Pee-wee went to the jail and with bail money and cigarettes in hand, helped bail out Betty's brother. When Pee-wee returned to the hotel, Betty and his car, they were gone. Pee-wee discovered that Betty's brother was actually Betty's husband, and he had escaped from prison with the aid of a razor blade tucked inside a carton of cigarettes. Well, Pee-wee was soon after caught by the police and returned back to prison. This time, he received an additional nine months in jail for aiding an escape and for knifing a fellow prisoner. Later, he was convicted of driving a stolen car across state lines, so he received three years in a federal prison in Atlanta, Georgia. While there, he got to know Frank Costello, a popular mafia boss, who named him the Little Hatchet Man and offered him future employment. August 1961, Pee-wee was released from prison, so he returned to Florence, South Carolina, and got a job working in the tobacco sheds. Soon, he was back to his old ways and was burglarizing homes. This time, however, he decided to make more of an effort to avoid being caught and arrested. What he decided to do was take a job with a traveling minister. He worked for this minister as his driver and general assistant. This would give him the opportunity to break into homes in different towns where the group preached. This would make the crimes harder to trace. In 1962, Pee Wee married for a third time. Shortly after, however, he was arrested for statutory rape of a 12-year-old girl, but he managed to escape, this time traveling to North Carolina. There, he met a 17-year-old and married for the fourth time, while well, she ended up turning him into the police, and Pee-wee was convicted of statutory rape. He received six years at the Columbia Penitentiary, and in November 1968, he was paroled. September 1969, Pee-wee picked up a female hitchhiker in North Carolina. He became angry with the young girl for laughing at him when he propositioned her for sex. So he beat her until she was unconscious and then raped, sodomized, and tortured her. Finally, he sunk her body down into a swamp where she drowned. This act of brutality is what Pee-wee would later describe as a vision due to his bothersome feelings that haunted him throughout his entire life. He finally discovered how to satisfy them. And from this point on, it was the driving force in his life. He would work on mastering his skill of torture. This involved keeping his mutilated victims alive for days. He would sometimes cannibalize their severed parts and then watched in horror as he forced the participants to eat their own body. Although Pee Wee preferred to attack female victims, he would also attack males who happened to be upon. By 1975, he had killed over 80 young boys and girls he found around the North Carolina highways. He now looked forward to these old bothersome feelings because it felt so good to relieve them through torture and murder. Pee Wee considered his highway murders as just simply weekend recreation. What? And he referred to killing personal acquaintances as, quote, serious murders, end quote. 
Victims of his serious murders included Janice Kirkey, who was his 15-year-old niece and her friend Patricia Alsobrook. His next serious murder was Martha Dix. She was a 20-year-old who was attracted to him and hung around him at his part-time job at the car repair shop. In 1973, Pee Wee purchased an old hearse. At this time, he was living in Prospect, South Carolina with his wife and now child. Around town, he had a reputation for being explosive, but they didn't consider him to be dangerous. Well, Pee Wee's next victim was Doreen Dempsey, who was 23 years old. She was an unwed mother of a two-year-old baby girl and pregnant with a second child. She decided to leave the area and she accepted a ride to the bus station from her old friend, Pee Wee. Instead, he took her to a wooded area, raped and killed her. Then he raped and sodomized her baby. After killing the child, he buried them together. Pee Wee would later describe the rape of the child as the best sex of his life. In 1975, Pee Wee was now 42 years old and a grandfather. He had also been steadily killing for six years. The same year, Pee Wee then murdered three people whose van just happened to break down on the side of the highway, but he needed help getting rid of their van. So he enlisted the help of an ex-con he knew, Walter Neely. So Walter drove the van to Pee Wee's garage and he repainted it so that he could then sell it and make a profit. February 12th, 1975, Pee Wee was paid $1,500 to kill Silas Yates. He was a wealthy farmer from Florence County. An angry ex-girlfriend named Susan Kipper had organized this. John Powell and John Owens handled all the correspondence between Susan and Pee Wee in arranging for the murder to occur. Diane Neely was Walter's ex-wife, she was involved. She claimed to have car problems and lured Silas Heats out of his home. Pee Wee then kidnapped and murdered Silas as John Powell and John Owens watched. Then the three of them buried his body. But that's not where it ends. Shortly afterwards, Diane Neely and her boyfriend, ex-con Avery Howard, attempted to blackmail Pee Wee for $5,000. So Pee Wee, he agreed to meet for the payoff. And then Diane and Avery were quickly disposed of. In the meantime, Pee Wee was busy killing and torturing other people he knew, including Kim Gelkins. She was a 13-year-old girl, and she had sexually rejected him. Two local men, Johnny Knight and Dennis Bellamy, had robbed Pee Wee's repair shop. They were both eventually killed and buried, but they weren't just buried anywhere. They were buried alongside other locals Pee Wee had killed. Pee Wee needed help with that though. So he had Walter nearly help him bury these two men. But what was the problem with this? Walter now knew where the graves of all the other locals who had been murdered were buried. In the meantime, police were investigating that disappearance of Kim Gelkins and all the leads that were turning up pointed to Pee Wee. After a search of his apartment, they found clothing that was worn by Kim. So Pee Wee was indicted for contributing to the delinquency of a miter. While he was awaiting trial in prison, Walter Neely broke down under police pressure. Not only did he confess, he showed police Pee Wee's personal cemetery and eight bodies were found in the graves. April 27, 1976, Pee Wee and Walter were charged with eight counts of murder. Pee Wee attempted to appear as just an innocent victim in all of this. But that didn't work. May 24th, 1976, a jury found Pee Wee Gaskins guilty of murdering Dennis Bellamy. He was later sentenced to death. He later confessed to the other seven murders only to avoid additional death sentences. November, 1976, Pee Wee's death sentence was commuted to life with seven consecutive life terms. This was after the U.S. Supreme Court ruled the death penalty unconstitutional. While in prison, Pee Wee enjoyed the wonderful treatment he received from the other inmates because of his now infamous reputation. In 1978, the death penalty was then again made legal in South Carolina. Pee Wee was then caught and tried and found guilty for the murder of a fellow prisoner, Rudolph Tierney, for many. So Pee Wee received 
the death sentence. Pee Wee tried to avoid anything to go to the electric chair. He began to confess to other murders, thinking this would help. During the last month of his life, Pee Wee spent time working with author Wilton Earl on a book called Final Truth, which was published in 1993. In the book, Pee Wee spent a lot of time talking about his murders and his feeling of something bothersome inside of him throughout his entire life. The closer his execution date became, the more philosophical that Pee Wee got. On Pee Wee's execution day, he slashed his wrists in an effort to postpone his execution. However, it didn't work. His wrists were stitched up and he was placed in the electric chair. September 6, 1991. Donald Pee Wee Guskins Jr. was pronounced dead by electrocution at 1.05 a.m. A quote from the book, Final Truth, Pee Wee said, quote, I have walked the same path as God by taking lives and making others afraid. I became God's equal. Through killing others, I became my own master. Through my own power, I come to my own redemption, end quote. That is the case of Donald Henry Gaskins Jr., also known as Pee Wee Gaskins. Thank you for sticking around for another episode of Danny After Dark. And thank you again to Kelvin and Ken for the case recommendation. Do you have any questions or comments on the case? Leave it down below. Let's be interactive. Do you have any suggestions for any cases that you would like me to cover? Leave it down below in the comments. You may see it featured in an upcoming episode. Until next time, remember, we don't live in darkness. Darkness lives in us.